Although we have this saying in English, don't judge a book by its cover, the truth is that the cover is an important part of the book. A large percentage of the readers and devotee of John Norman's book series, Gore, the Counter-Earth Chronicles, the Gorian Saga, whatever you want to call it, a large percentage of the readers would admit that they started reading in the first place because, as teenage boys, the highly sexually suggestive cover art caught their eye and stoked their curiosity. What's more interesting to note in this case is that the first editions of the books, when they were first published in the United States of America, had covers that were in absolutely no way sexually suggestive or provocative. The publishing companies, plural, who tried to make money out of these books, only realized in retrospect, many years later, just how pornographic these books were. They went back and issued second and third editions. Later editions of these books had increasingly sexually explicit covers as they figured out that's what the audience was interested in, that was what the market was, and even that was the core content of these books that the author was trying to get across. So when we look at the content of these books and we look at the intent of the author, there is a peculiar tension with what is written out so plainly, shall we say, in the cover art of these books. And that is these books are at least erotic, if not outright pornographic. But here's where the strange tension lies. No one could have less of a detached, good-humored attitude towards this than the author of the books himself. I think there would be no political controversy surrounding the Gore books whatsoever if he had the same sort of relaxed Hollywood entertainer's attitude as someone like Kevin Smith. Kevin Smith is a film writer, movie director, what have you. If he just had the attitude of, well, you know, these books are a little bit eccentric, but so am I and so are my readers. Well, you know, it's all in good fun. Um, who hasn't had a wacky off-the-wall fantasy like this once in a while? No, no, no. The enduring significance of this, these books and their enduring infamy and their source of political controversy is created by the incongruous fact that the author was a professor of philosophy and he took these books seriously to a mind-blowing extent as not merely his satire in our society as it is now, but the pronouncement of his political and social philosophy for what our society ought to be. And that makes the sexual content, shall we say, all the more disturbing and all the more worthy of reflecting on in the next few minutes of this video. Quote, perhaps the books touch on neglected or suppressed human constants, male and female. Perhaps they have something to say which has not been said for a long time. They are probably unique or almost so in modern literature, in raising serious questions about the intellectual superstructure of Western civilization. <laughs> oh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> the cover of the books doesn't just matter to the members of the audience, the reading public. How is it possible for this guy, who is a professor of philosophy in New York State, how is it possible for him to hold up the book with, with these sexually graphic covers on it. How is it possible for him to be making millions of dollars out of peddling porn, porn based on his own twisted sexual fantasies, and to say, dead serious, with a straight face in this way, these books are unique in modern literature in raising serious questions about the intellectual superstructure of Western civilization. Absolutely nothing about the cover of these books suggests that they're raising serious intellectual questions. And let me tell you something, as this video goes on, I think you and my audience will come to agree with me that nothing about the content of these books raises such serious questions. They have intellectual content. There are ideas in them. Perhaps that is what so outrages some critics. He here compares himself to no less important a thinker than James Watt the inventor of the steam engine, M many scientific breakthroughs uh, related to the transformation of the, the modern West, <laughs> he compares himself in writing these sex fantasies to James Watt in challenging and transforming our civilization. Quote, Hero of Alexandria in the 2nd century BC invented the steam engine. 
James Watt in the 18th century designs an improved steam engine and alters the course of human civilization. I think a similar phenomenon has occurred with the Korean books. How is it possible to be this delusional? <laughs> and let's just pause and reflect on this for a moment. Again, keeping the lurid cover art in mind, what is the discovery that he thinks is equivalent to discovering the steam engine, industrialization, electricity, these kinds of things? What is the breakthrough that he's saying people knew in ancient times, in the second century BC, and then they're rediscovering now in his sexy fantasy books, it's slavery. <laughs> his idea is that in ancient Greece, they had kinky sex slavery, and now here he is again, rediscovering and, and, and profoundly transforming kinky sex slavery. You know, in the same sense that James Watt you know, didn't, didn't just rediscover the steam engine, he profoundly changed their civilization. The claim is that John Norman, in writing the Gore books, is now going to transform the future of our civilization by rediscovering something from the past that was forgotten. And what it is he's rediscovering is men taking women captive, enslaving them, and in plain English, raping them. And that his claim is this isn't just the only thing that can make men happy. This is the only thing that can make women happy. It's the only way to set Western civilization back on the right path. So again, a little, little bit of a contrast from the joking, self-effacing attitude of someone like Kevin Smith. Kevin Smith very often is challenged about the fact that one film or another of his is absolutely terrible. Perhaps the majority of his films are absolutely terrible. And he's able to sit there in a relaxed way and say, well, he's just a storyteller. He's just having fun and some people like it. If that were John Norman's attitude toward his creative output, I think I can say we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. There wouldn't be any political controversy uh, surrounding these books. But I think because this was his attitude, because he took this um, strident philosophical and political position, I think this controversy is never going to die. I think 100 years from now, the Gore books and their fans are going to be with us and there are going to be mo new movies being made out of them. I think the inspiration, like, like Conan the Barbarian, like Star Wars, I think there are some elements of this that will, that will never, ever die. I'm, do I'm doing my part. <laughs> Quote, Obviously, my books answer to certain deep needs in human beings. If they were not important to people, if they did not have something important to say, something which apparently desperately needs saying, they would not be as popular as they are. Close quote. Now, this type of claim is very difficult to make about comedy. I could say that when I was a child, I responded to the comedy of Chris Rock, stand-up comedian, because it spoke to certain repressed political problems that existed in downtown Toronto, Canada. Most obviously, um, the, the shadow of the Black Panther uh, radicalism of the 1970s and the divisions between black and white, ethnic conflict, and this kind of thing. Um, th there was something I could say that his comedy, that it meant for me, that made this seem powerful and important. But to make these kinds of generalizations, even with comedy, even with something as explicitly political as comedy can be, is incredibly dangerous. I mean, if we're being honest, why did Chris Rock become so popular? Did it have nothing to do with the fact that he makes a lot of jokes about cheating on his wife and sleeping around? It's, it's just an incredibly fatuous, self-serving uh, path we start to go down when we try to justify you know, what appeals to us, even in comedy or even in politics as representing something profound for all human beings or something that shifts in our own time. And as I'm suggesting here with this illustration, it's much, much more surreal, much, much more self-serving and delusional when we say this about pornography rather than when we say this about comedy or something with an explicit political message, right? O on screen there, I'm contrasting two women who were respectively the most successful pornographic actresses in their, in their time, all right? One is Eva Elfie, and one is Gianna Michaels. So about 12 years apart, these women were the, the leading pornographic stars. What, what can you read into this? Like what, what, you know, okay, I could try to construct some kind of social commentary, like, well, you know, um, 
12 years ago, uh, hip hop music was going through this period where, you know, female body image linked to rapid. You can try. You can try. But you know what the truth is? There's absolutely nothing we can read into this. At any given moment, including right now, you can Google around on the internet and you can find a dozen women who look just like Gianna Michaels and a dozen women who just look like uh, Ava Elfie, just very similar looking people who never became stars, who never became wildly popular. You can find all kinds of cross currents in culture that way, but especially in something that blatantly appeals to the erotic, right? There is no rational explanation for why one person was a successful actress and another person was not. Why one person became famous and another person languished in obscurity when they were just as beautiful or what have you. And you know why? Because desire is irrational. Desire is the most irrational and arbitrary part of human nature. But if you're looking at the cover of the gore books, if you're looking at these pictures of women in bikinis with swords and so on, it doesn't take that much imagination to figure out that, yes, indeed, we're dealing with the erotic, pornographic, desiring side of human nature that irrationally fa fastens on one woman and becomes fascinated with her and makes her famous and makes her the most famous sex symbol of her generation and fails to fasten on another, all right? The arbitrariness of fame is quite surreal if you're talking about comedy or action movies or uh, adventure movies. It's already arbitrary enough. But when you step into the blatantly erotic, when you step into the, the realm of pornography, the extent to which it's arbitrary, irrational, and not susceptible to analysis all right, is on a whole other level. Let's, let's not go any further with quoting the interviews with John Norman. Let's not go any further with uh, the philosophy of John Norman in his own words without a little soupçon, a little taste of what it is you're missing out in in these books. What it is that he characterizes as having so much profound intellectual content, transforming our civilization, etc., etc. In this book, Norman continues his pattern of storytelling, interspersed with detailed explanations of how to train a slave, how to make a lawn bowl, <laughs> how to train a slave, how to make a ship, how to train a slave, how to fight naval warfare, how to train a slave. Did, did, I, did I mention how to train a slave? <laughs> this, this guy is joking about the extent to which these books incredibly repetitiously try to inculcate this philosophy of male dominance of female slaves into the readers. He's joking about it, but notice at the top of the screen, four stars. Many of the harshest critics of the Gore series are people who openly admit they love the books, they enjoy the books, but they can admit and they can joke about the extent to which this is really kind of perverse and bizarre and repetitious and reflects some kind of monomania or insanity on the part of the author. All right, another four-star review for the same book. Taro has a bit of an existential crisis. And even though I like this book, the reason behind it was handled very poorly and so out of character that it is laughable. And he decides that money is what he wants in life. And so he becomes a pirate. Arr. Tarl suddenly has no problem with torturing his captives. He also has no problem with keeping lots of slaves and pimp-slapping them at will and going beast mode on them at the slightest infraction. Despite the big tonal shift, I actually like this entry into the gore canon. Although much of the old recipe is still in effect here. Tarl meets woman. Woman and Tarl are mean to each other. Tarl and woman eventually fall in love after woman realizes how awesome slavery is. <laughs> Again, this is a critique coming from someone who loves the books and who appreciates what the author does intellectually or in terms of providing a good adventure story. Whatever it is he may, he may appreciate. This isn't someone who hates the books, but this is someone who can admit how deeply flawed they are. Uh, readers of the books, whether they love them or hate them, debate at what point the series started to go downhill, at what point the author's sexual political and philosophical obsession started to destroy the quality of the books, but many of them would name this specific book, Raiders of Gore, as the turning point. Prior to this, there was at least some ethical tension in that the main character in the books disapproved of slavery. And as you've just heard, from this book forward, after he briefly becomes a slave himself, he 110% embraces slavery. And this becomes a univocal soapbox for the author to preach his pro-slavery, pro-rape, pro-violence to women views without the ethical ambiguity that was provided by having a 
main character, even a narrator, who in the earlier books at least felt some kind of misgivings about embracing that ethos. From a website called Books Without Any Pictures, Based on reviews I've read, there's a point where the series starts to go way downhill. I've definitely reached that point. It also represents a major departure from the series thus far, because instead of focusing on Carl Tabot, the hero of all the previous books, it instead chooses to use an Earth woman as the protagonist, Eleanor Brinton, a rich bitch New York City socialite who hates men. That's her defining personality trait. Her only personality trait, even. One night, Eleanor is captured and taken to Gore, where it's pretty obvious what happens to her. She quickly learns that on Gore, women have no social status, and she changes hands between a variety of different men. Here's a one-star review. If you are into domination and submission, then this is the book for you. If not, it will bore you out of your brain, despite the rather well-crafted science fantasy world the story inhabits. There is page after page of stuff like this. Naked and in chains, humiliated, spoiled rich bitch lifts her head and rages, I am not a slave, I am not a slave. Barbarian hunk roars and strikes her across the face and then kicks her in the guts. Say you are a slave, wench. Sobbing, humiliated, spoiled rich bitch hangs her head and says, I am a slave, I am a slave. I kid you not, that is the book and I've just saved you a lot of time. Another one star review, Everyone said that this book marks the point that the Gore novels start going downhill. As a big fan of the novels, I didn't want to believe it. Well, let me tell you, this novel is awful. Here is the plot in a scene which is repeated over and over and over. Girl, quote, I am not a slave. Man, you are a slave. Girl, okay, I am a slave and it feels so right. The end. This book represents something of a turning point in the series in terms of its misogyny. For the first time, I think, it actually mentions the concept of rape. Previously, the book series was coy about it, using euphemisms like taking, possessing, enjoying, etc. But in this book, it actually mentions rape directly or explicitly. Likewise, this book portrays actual violence against the women being hunted slash enslaved, a particular unfortunate being shot through the shoulder and pinned to a tree by an arrow. It also describes in greater detail the physical maiming inflicted on women who do not adequately adapt themselves to their lives of sexual enslavement. This is also the most sexually explicit of the books thus far. Previously, the narrative would always pan to the moon or fade to black whenever a sexy time begins. This book gets a little braver before cutting away. Which is, of course, one of the most baffling things about this series. Yes, it's all about male dominance and the glorification of rape culture. Quite literally, quote, fuck her until she loves you, close quote. But it doesn't bother to realistically portray the psychological slash emotional ramifications of this behavior. What fun would that be? So it is clearly a fantasy for those who enjoy that kink. But why is it that he's so shy about the actual sex? Many of the reviews ask this, like, why does it not actually describe the sex? You get all these descriptions of chains. <laughs> chains and whips and like the procedures of enslaving people but then the sex itself the author seems to be uncomfortable actually describing beyond the use of uh, some vague euphemisms slave girl of gore gets a one-star review any reviews of this book have to begin with a comparison to captive of gore captive of gore was the first book in the series to be narrated by someone other than tarl being narrated by an earth female captured and taken to gore as a slave just want to pause to note Absolutely, by definition, none of this is about BDSM because none of this is about people consensually having sex or playing games. This is not about consensual sex between adults. This is about people being abducted, kidnapped, taken captive, brutally raped, etc. Okay? This is very clearly and explicitly not about consensual sex. So anyone in, who happens to click on this video who's a fan of these books, please accept the fact that that is what you are in the position of making excuses for. You're actually making excuses for a political philosophy that's asserting people genuinely violating one another's consent, taking people captive, enslaving them, etc., is for the victim's own good because, John Norman argues, inwardly and secretly, that is what women want, even if they don't know it yet until after this traumatic experience happens to them. So she is an Earth female taken captive and relocated to Gore. 
This is essentially the same story as the earlier book, Captive of Gore. In Captive of Gore, we have Eleanor Brinton, a rich bitch socialite, who is beaten into submission until she likes it. In Slave Girl of Gore, we have Judy Thornton, a college student taken to Gore and raped into submission until she likes it. There are a few differences between the books that are noteworthy. One of the main differences in the books is that while Eleanor, in the earlier book, resisted her slavery, mostly through whining and screaming, Judy, in the later book, took to it quickly, too quickly. Judy is literally melting in the hands of her rapists and, quote, realizing her place, close quote, within hours of being drugged and transported to an alien world. While Eleanor remained in shock for much of her own story, which is more believable, and was constantly crying, plotting, and scheming to get out of her predicament, Judy instantly converts from a naive, virginal, opinionated college student to a gushing, love-starved, submissive sex slave. Both books, however, make the same point about that conversion. It's what women really want. A subtle difference between the books is that Captive of Gore took an approach that some women just don't know what they want, and all you have to do is beat them and rape them until they realize it. However, Slave Girl goes further than Captive by claiming that all women are submissive and natural sex slaves, and they can't wait to show you. Norman steps up this rhetoric from book to book, at least he's consistent.